Even 1,500 years after his bloody death, his name continues to be associated with brutality. He called himself Flagellante, the Scourge of God. By giving him a goat-like beard and devil's horns, ancient artists emphasized his inhumanity. Both then and now, he appeared to be the perfect example of an Asian step nomad, hideous, squat, and menacing, deadly with a bow, and primarily interested in rape and looting. Attila was a savage destroyer for Edward Gibbon, who did not have much affection for the Roman Empire, which the Huns regularly pillaged between 434 and 453 AD. A man born into the earth to rock the nations, as the Roman historian Jordanes put it. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Hallmark History. Attila the Hun, one of history's most infamous villains, is the subject of today's video. The Huns, led by their tyrannical leader Attila, terrorized much of Europe in the 5th century. He has earned the label of barbarian due to the brutality of his military campaigns. The story of Attila, however, is not as simple as it first appears. His reign saw the Huns rise to become one of the world's most powerful empires, but he was more than just a brutal dictator. We trust you will take pleasure in watching about Attila and the changes he brought about in history. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, please subscribe and like this video. From 434 until 453, Attila the Hun governed the Hunnic Empire and wandering Huns. This warlord and politician held various tribes together for a long period. According to Miles Russell, he brutally extorted money from his adversaries. Attila and his brother bled were King Rila's nephews. The Huns entered the Roman Empire in the 4th century AD. Bleda and Attila may have learned to ride as toddlers. The Huns were noted for the precision with which they fired arrows from mounted positions, therefore they likely had archery training. Due to polygamy's importance in sustaining Hunnic clan unity, he probably had numerous consorts. In 434, King Ruila died, and his nephews took over. Bleda and Attila's ability to share authority for nearly a decade implies they tolerated one another. Bleda died in 445. Some have speculated that Attila was involved. The information we've uncovered suggests he killed his sibling to promote his political career. Attila is a historical villain. God's Scourge was the worst of the barbarians who tore the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD. Given his accomplishments, John Mann finds it hard to understand. His empire never covered more than a few acres of Roman territory and disappeared overnight after his death in 453. He failed. Why is he feared? Part of the solution lies in Attila's rise. In the 4th century, the Huns emerged in Central Asia. They may be descended from the Xiongnu or Hunnu, who ruled Mongolia for 300 years before China divided it in the 2nd century AD. If the Huns were the Xiongnu, they forgot their former glory as they advanced west. The Greeks first noticed them in 375 as pastoral nomads who were masters of mounted archery, shooting with power and accuracy while galloping. In 378, they helped Goths destroy the Roman army at Adrianople present-day Adirni, in Turkey. Rome's heyday was over. The empire disintegrated 100 years ago. Since Constantine founded Constantinople, also known as New Rome, in 330, its western and eastern, Latin and Greek halves have grown apart. In 364, each half elected its own emperor, widening the divide. Family and historical ties couldn't protect a divided empire from Germanic tribes beyond the Rhine and Danube. The Huns, with Turkish ancestry, emerged from Ukraine, amplifying the barbarian threat. Their abilities allowed them to reach modern-day Hungary, where Attila killed his co-regent and brother Bleda in 444-445. Attila's allies allowed him to raise forces never before seen, with mounted warriors, infantry, and siege engines. Attila's dominion spanned from the Baltic to the Balkans and the Rhine to the Black Sea. From southern Hungary, he conducted four major and several lesser assaults against Rome's eastern and western provinces. After bathing their horses in the Loire the year before, Hun troops marching to Constantinople in 441 could have bathed in the Po. According to Miles Russell, Attila's intelligence and military prowess unified a loose alliance of tribes. Priscus, a Constantinople envoy, said Attila was a highly knowledgeable counselor, kind to those who sought it, and faithful to his friends. Priscus said that because corruption, injustice, and taxation were rare under the Huns, many thought life was better than under the Romans. While Attila was alive, 
his dominion operated effectively. The Huns learned that clear and implicit threats could collect large quantities of money from the Roman Empire. Theodosius II paid the Huns 350 pounds of gold a year between 420 and 430 to keep them away. By 442, this reached 1,000 pounds when Theodosius refused to pay in 447, Attila burned Balkan cities. After Attila up the annual amount to 2,100 pounds of gold, Theodosius agreed to settle the debt and resume payments. The Hunnic king was unfriendly, Attila restricted border crossings because he feared Roman extravagances would harm his people. He ordered that no Hun might dwell in the Roman Empire or join its military, and Roman deserters would be punished by him. By ordering Theodosius to build the no landmans along the border, Attila prevented any direct contact, creating the first iron curtain between the Romans and Huns. Roman envoys traveled to Margus, Attila's capital near Belgrade, to negotiate and give tribute. Priscus says in his eyewitness account of Attila's court that ambassadors were called to a banquet after waiting for days. Attila was seated at the head of the gathering on a high couch. Priscus says everyone at the gathering ate luxurious food on silver dishes, while Attila luxurious food on silver dishes, guests drank from gold goblets, but he used a wooden cup. According to John Mann, the scant available facts suggest we are dealing with an unusual personality. Attila's ambition and booty addiction made him overambitious. He wanted to conquer the world, therefore he took huge risks. Attila's ambition exceeded personal interests, evidence shows. Politically necessary. To pacify his chieftains, he required plunder. This involved raids, fighting, and, as his dominion increased, conquest. Conquest would be harder. Attila must learn government administration, finances, and record keeping. His dominion wouldn't be safe from battle and defeat unless he changed his people's culture, developed cities, and merged into the West. As an uneducated barbarian army leader, Attila couldn't envisage a settled existence, so he used secretaries and envoys to play politics. Attila couldn't solve this problem, but Genghis Khan did eight hundred years later. His only response was war. 450, he turned west. His amazing justifications for war revealed his war obsession. Honoria, Valentinian III's sister and the Ravenna inhabitant, is the story's heroine. Honoria had her own apartments and crew but little power. She had brother Envy. Because she was bored with her affluence, she had an affair with her chamberlain, Eugenius. Honoria married a powerful consul after Eugenius' execution for adultery. Gibbon portrays Honoria as a bewildered teen in decline and fall. She was shrewd at 30. She was enraged and wanted revenge on her brother. She sent a dedicated eunuch, Hyacinthus, to Attila, promising him money in exchange for saving her from a hideous marriage. Hyacinthus showed Attila good trust by holding her ring. Honoria's deeds were discovered. After returning, Hyacinthus was decapitated. Attila planned an invasion. Honoria's ludicrous promise provided the perfect excuse to stop a Constantinople attack. In one telegram, he wanted Honoria's co-rulership, in another, half of Valentinian's empire is Honoria's dowry, and in still another, your palace. He sent Valentinian worse and worse messages. Valentinian's refusal gave Attila defense. Attila crossed the Rhine in 451 AD. Unknown circumstances may have caused the transition from bribery to military action. To maintain his power, he may have required to exhibit strength. He may have felt disrespected by the Western Roman Empire, or gold. Historiography credits Honoria's letter as a spark, detailed above. The Huns were inside the empire, burning, pillaging, and slaughtering citizens. A Roman and Visigothic force stopped him from dividing Gaul to Orléans. He traveled two-thirds of France. Attila's army was too stretched to battle. He retreated until forced to fight in the Catalanian plains between Chalon and Shra. Some texts go here on June 20th, 451. Both sides fought on Catalanian plains near Tra, France. More than 160,000 people died on both sides, and the fields and rivers were swollen with blood, according to Roman historian Jordanes. The Huns lost, but it was close. Attila was about to commit suicide on a pyre of wooden saddles when Aetius freed him. Why? Miles Russell speculates that he still saw value in the Huns. Maybe he let a renowned foe leave with honor. Aetius grew up as a Hun prisoner with Attila. Both men admired one another despite being on opposing sides. According to John Mann, 
Atheists sent the Visigoths back to their homeland in southwestern France and Attila to Hungary out of fear that their defeat would lead to the rebirth of the Visigoths, who were formerly Rome's foes but now their allies. Attila's release would be a catastrophic mistake. Attila couldn't be happy because he lacked cash to maintain his army. Attila returned the following year with an even larger force and attacked Rome in northern Italy. After conquering a dozen cities in the Po Valley, the Huns were halted by disease and famine and returned to Hungary. After Aquileia fell, Valentinian, Emperor of the West, dispatched envoys to Attila in an attempt to come to terms. One of the messengers was Leo, the Bishop of Rome. No one knows what was discussed because the Huns just left after the meeting was over. In the eyes of the church, this was a great miracle with God's word and Leo's bravery saving Rome. Raphael painted a picture to forever remember this time in history. Leo stares down Attila defiantly as Saints Peter and Paul come crashing down from heaven behind him, ready for fight. The demonic Attila trembles in fear at this. Perhaps the truth was more realistic. The Emperor presented an all-or-nothing surrender offer, satisfying all of Attila's requests in exchange for the honor of being Attila's wife and gold dowry. Like his troops, Attila was doubtless starting to feel the effects of the campaign in Italy, with food supplies low and sickness rampant. Even still, by this time next year, Attila the Hun would be no more. There are various accounts of the death of the Scourge of God. Attila wed a woman named Ildiko in the year 453. The morrow, his body was discovered. Attila was allegedly drunk on the night of his wedding. He drank too much and a blood vessel ruptured resulting in blood gushing into his throat and suffocating him to death. There are also theories that Attila was murdered by Ildiko, an agent of the Byzantine Emperor Martian, or that he died of alcohol intoxication. The Hunnic Empire collapsed quickly after Attila's death, for whatever reason. Alak, Dengizic, and Ernok, three of Attila's sons, were given control of different parts of the empire. Wars broke out as the brothers competed for control of more area. The Huns' vassals regarded this as a chance to break free from their masters. Arderic, king of the Jeopardy, was the first to lead an uprising against the Huns. At the Battle of Nidau in 454, Arderic led Hun army to victory and ultimately ensured Alak's demise. Arderic's example was swiftly followed by other tribes, and the Hunnic Empire collapsed. After the year 469 AD, there is no further mention of Hun wars, settlements, or activity in any historical source. All that is left of the Huns are stories of how scary they were when commanded by Attila the Hun, their greatest leader. Let me begin by saying how much I appreciate you coming along on our trip back in time to witness Attila the Hun on the Hallmark History Channel. I'm hoping you had a great time seeing this episode and that you gained some interesting new insights into this fascinating person.